Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. I'm incredibly excited for today's guest, and I think you will be too. Dr. Kevin Stock, a strict carnivore, has been passionate about health and fitness for two decades. He was the founder, CEO of Muscle of Science, a national-level physique competitor, and self-experimental researcher and scientist. He began his professional career as a dental sleep medicine dentist, where he treated obstructive sleep apnea in his private practice. From there, he invented the NED device, an intranasal device designed to treat snoring and OSA. He is the author of the novella Your Drum and soon to be released Meat Health, The Carnivore Diet, The Hunt to Become Superhuman. Uh, I should also mention that Kevin is a giant fan of puns, um, and I really (laughs) appreciate his puns, especially when they pertain to plants. Um, Currently, Dr. Stock is the founder and CEO at Scriptus, Meat Health, and NED. He is an active writer, reader, and researcher on topics from health and fitness to Bitcoin and blockchain to science and philosophy. He shares his finding on his blog notes to self in his Saturday seven newsletter, which I love and on Kevin stock radio. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Hey Scott. Thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. Um, excited to dig into a few topics with you. Um, but would love to just start with how did you come to carnivore and, and what made you investigate it? Oh, all right. Well, that, that could be a long conversation. Uh, but I guess just for, for a little bit of background, Uh, I've been in health and fitness for forever and mainly from uh, a bodybuilding total vanity perspective. Uh, So throughout my studies in school, you know, I studied chemistry in college and biology and then I went on to dental school. But I took all this anatomy and physiology and filtered it through uh, a lens of, of nutrition, but also bodybuilding. And so, you know, I thought I'd I'd come across, you know, every diet. I've tried everything. And it was not until a couple of years ago when I decided to kind of give up on the bodybuilding diet as I was really trying to optimize not for physique so much, but for mental performance, for lack of a better word, Uh, because I had started a couple of new companies and I was, you know, burning the candlelight at both ends. Uh, and so long story short, and then we can go into more detail if you want. Uh, but I, I'd done a ketogenic diet before and, you know, I'd heard about a lot of people would, you know, have really improved their, their mental capacity. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't get uh, fatigued in the afternoon or whatnot. And I'd actually done, uh, ketogenic diets in the past, but I had never gone what I call full keto. And I'll explain what I mean by that, uh, but nonetheless, I, I decided to go full keto. And so by full keto, I mean, <laughs> in the past, with a bodybuilding background, I would never let my protein intake go below one gram per pound of body weight. Uh, and so I did, I, you know, when I'd done ketogenic diets in the past, I wasn't sure about the depth of ketosis. I, you know, I used urine strips and it said I was in ketosis and, ketosis and whatnot. Uh, but I, I really didn't limit protein that much, you know, basically one gram per pound. But anyways, this time I decided I was really going to go full keto and I was going to limit protein to a standard keto protocol, which a lot of times it's 0.75 grams per pound of body weight. Uh, and so I limited my protein and sure enough, my greatest fear happened. You know, I, I lost a tremendous amount of lean body mass, you know, kind of my, I had muscle atrophy for sure. Uh, so I lost weight and I don't, I don't know if I had any real boost in mental performance. So nonetheless, I started, started tinkering again, uh, and did a lot of research into plants and so <laughs> slowly started eliminating them and went to the carnivore diet and had not been shocked by a result of a diet like the carnivore diet, which is why I'm so passionate about it now because it, it cause it really did shock me. Uh, kind of the transformation I had and how I felt. 
That's awesome. Thanks. So Kevin. did that make sense? I, I don't know if I did a good chronological story there or not. No, no, that's excellent. Um, and, and definitely resonates with myself as well. And in my journey, um, I sort of inched along towards keto, um, all while being sort of fearful of, of limiting protein as well myself. Um, did and, you ever limit protein in your keto journey? Um, I would say there were days when I tried to do it, never a long stretch. Um, I was always, uh, big on protein. Um, you know, even in college when I, when I was, when I was an athlete, when I was a rower, um, prior to adopting a, a paleo or ketogenic diet, I was ingesting large amounts of whey protein and Greek yep. yogurt and just, oh, I always knew protein was important. Yeah. Uh, and so what's interesting is when I, decided to like, all right, I know I can't believe I'm going to you know really restrict protein. I know this is probably not going to be good for physique reasons. Uh, but then you start chasing ketones. And so then I was like, well, how, how deep can I get my ketones? How much is this going to help me? Uh, and, you know, chasing ketones for, for so many people is just not the right, right goal. Like <laughs> they, they get addicted to a, uh, you know, a monitor and trying to hit, hit certain depths of ketosis when really, you know, maybe they have a fat loss goal or maybe they have a mental clarity goal or maybe they have some other goal uh, and they're trying to use ketones as a way to get to that goal. And usually that's not the best metric. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and, and I believe you had a post about this, but I think of ketones as just really almost a waste product. And yeah. when you're spilling a lot of them, especially when you're adapting to keto, having a lot of fat for the first time, it just basically means your body's not using it. Exactly. Um, which <laughs> having a higher level is, isn't good. It's, it's actually bad. Um, and so once you get adapted and your ketone numbers go down and, you know, maybe you don't need all that fat, but your body can produce ketones a lot more easily. Um, you know, your, your levels will actually decrease, um, yep. when you're more fat adapted and keto adapted. Yep. Um, and it's dangerous because people will see their ketone levels start to go down. And in reality, they're just using them more efficiently. But then they're like, oh, I have to increase fat even more. I have to decrease protein even more. Uh, and when in reality, you know, they're in ketosis. They're, and, we're, and we can talk more about ketosis, but, you know, we, in varying levels of ketosis and trying to eat more fat and decrease more protein is, you know, they may get more ketones in their urine or whatnot, but it's not it's not really doing them any good. Yeah, yeah. Uh Completely agree. Um, and, and I love the way you articulate some of these concepts. I definitely want to get back to, um, the concept of, of building muscle on carnivore and, and fat to protein ratios as well. But yeah. one thing I just wanted to address that you said is you realized a lot of these amazing benefits when you did adopt carnivore and, and really committed to it. Can you talk about some of those? Yeah. So I was, I was really going after, like I mentioned, mental, stamina so to speak like my goal was i wanted to wake up in the morning and you know how you feel fresh in the morning it's like hey i can get work done and i wanted to have that throughout the day until late at night when i went to bed and i and you know it kind of seemed like an unrealistic goal uh, but it was something that i was so far away from uh that i was like any kind of that, that that's the direction i was trying to move and you know, in the past, what I was doing is I, you know, I was drinking a whole lot of coffee, uh, and I would structure my day in such a way to try and increase mental performance. So I would go to work, I would work, and then I would start down in coffee once I started getting tired. And then once I had a lot of coffee and, and I'm going downhill again, then I'd go work out and I'd go back to work and I'd start going down again. And then I'd need some kind of other pickup. So it's like I tried to structure my day in order to ment uh, to optimize this mental performance, uh, which I was able to get the biggest benefit when I switched to carnivore. Uh, so I didn't have any more of the drops. You know, I felt good. My energy was great. Uh, and th th I think there's a lot of things that contributed to it, but I think one of the biggest thing is, is animal fat. Uh, because I, you're as an athlete background yourself, you, you may have grown up or heard a lot, like, you know, you eat a lot of lean proteins, you eat quote unquote healthy fats, you know, you might, have carbohydrates after you work out or something like that. Uh, but I didn't have a lot of animal fat in my diet up until I did a carnivore diet. You know, red meat was kind of always seen as like, you know, not a bad thing, but just I didn't eat that much of it. And uh, so I think that is what I attribute the biggest gain from uh, the increased animal fat in the diet. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it, it's always fascinating to me talking to folks, you know, talking about whether it was the elimination of certain foods, the addition of certain foods, the emphasis yeah. on certain foods. Um, it's usually a combination of, of, of all those. You're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, absolutely. Actually, I think the worst body composition and the worst I ever felt was a year that I gave up red meat um, and I wasn't eating like vegan or anything like that. But I had just, you know, like most of the general public anecdotally heard these stories. Oh, red meat is bad for you. Red meat sits in your colon, blah, 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 all this stuff. Yeah. And so I gave it up for a year and I was eating pretty much my protein was a lot of lean chicken breast. Um, yep. And I was eating kind of a paleo diet, but without meat. Um, and I felt awful, um, yep. and my body composition wasn't great. Um, and so it, 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 I think it's a lot of what you're saying is, is definitely resonating with me with the animal fats and, and, you know, the cholesterol that you need, yep. um, for so many vital functions and your hormones, your brain, etc. Yeah. And with the ketogenic diet, cause so many people that start carnivore come from a ketogenic diet I've found. Uh, and you think, and people do ketogenic diets very differently. So there's not just one very common approach. But, you know, when I was doing keto, I still didn't eat that much red meat because I was trying to limit protein. And so uh, it, it, a lot of times people on a ketogenic diet aren't eating that much red meat either. So when they switch to carnivore, they are seeing such dramatic improvements. I think it's because of two things. Keto diets tend to not be as high in, as, in red meat as uh as advertised <laughs> and el elimination of fiber, which we can talk about, uh, you know, if you want to talk about that, but, but those two things, uh, you know, people going from keto to carnivore see tremendous improvements. Yeah. And people see, people see tremendous improvements when they go from a standard American diet or whatever to keto. I think that's a step in the right direction for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think this is a good time to talk about, um, you know, your meat health guide and, and something I didn't, I didn't address in the intro, but I feel like I, I need to is Kevin is, is an incredibly impressive guy. Um, you, you're doing so many great things, um, and really impressed by your entrepreneurship, your research background, your, your physique background, but you're also just so good at answering people's questions, um, <laughs> in your Facebook group, um, on, on your blog. So I, I really appreciate that. I think it says a lot about you. Um, well, thanks. I appreciate that. I, I know I, I had a lot of trouble when I switched to carnivore. Uh, and I have, a, and that was with a lot of background in nutrition and a lot of research. And so, you know, I sympathize with people that, you know, they want to make a change and they're having problems because people will hear about this carnivore diet. It sounds so easy, you know, eat meat, drink water. That's like the easiest diet ever. Uh, but ironically, like out of that simplicity is there's a lot, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of questions that arise, a lot of issues that people need to take care of. And, you know, getting started is, I, I it's just, it's not easy. <laughs> Yeah, and that's why I love I love your your meat health guide. Um, I have it up on my website as as a getting started resource um, for folks. So can you get into? Of course, what are the three levels of carnivore you outline in that guide, and, and how do you sort of think about that? And uh, I'd, I'd also love to hear about how you went from drinking that much coffee to uh, <laughs> eventually eliminating it. Yeah, so. The way I devise a guide is I just wanted to make it easy for basically anyone to be able to find success uh, and not necessarily easy as in like a cakewalk, but easy to understand where to go and, and what to do. And so basically I set it up in three levels. And the first level is it's basically the classic carnivore, eat meat, drink water. And then there's all these questionable foods that people have talk about. What about coffee? What about dairy? What about eggs? What about X, Y, and Z? And so you, you can easily get overwhelmed with these, I'll call them gray area foods. And so for level one, I'm like, don't worry about it. Uh, go ahead and allow all those foods. Eat them. You know, eat eggs, eat dairy, eat, eat, eat meat, drink, drink water. If you, if you're a coffee drinker, keep coffee in. If you drink tea, keep tea in. And, the reason is you're going to have almost everyone, not, I shouldn't say that, but a lot of people have adaptation symptoms. And if you're trying to give up coffee, give up all these other foods, it, it can be overwhelming. And so level one is basically, hey, eat meat, drink water, but 
If you have these other side items, go ahead and keep them in. And then that helps ease in the first 30 days. And then level two is just a step further. We address, we're like, okay, these are the side items, things like dairy, things like eggs, things like coffee, things like tea. And in level two, I say, if you want, a lot of people are thriving after level one. They never even touch level two, and that's totally fine. Uh, but if you, if, if you want to progress further, and I, I recommend this because uh, sometimes you can identify something that's giving you a problem that you didn't know it was. Uh, but in level two, you basically you get rid of those side items. So get rid of pork. I mean, I'm sorry, pork is meat. <laughs> get, get rid of eggs. I'll talk about the pork here to say that's level three. Uh, but get rid of eggs, get rid of dairy. If you can, I recommend people ditch coffee for at least 30 days. Maybe not at the same time you're ditching these other foods, uh, but at some point, cutting coffee and then if you want, bring it back in. And the reason I say that is for some people, that seriously makes all the difference. Uh, and a lot of people, once they cut it out, they don't bring it back in just because they feel that much better without it. Uh, that said, a lot of people keep coffee in. So does that make sense about level two? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's I, great. I can jump into, so level three is the strictest of the levels and it is quite literally just beef and water. Uh, so you eliminate other meats in level three. So you eliminate things like pork, you eliminate seafood, uh, and you stick to beef and you stick to water. And in the guide, I recommend if you're a super sensitive individual, maybe do one week of just grass, grass fed beef because people with celiac disease or like severe, uh, gluten sensitivities, they'll even have sensitivities to beef that is finished with grain. So there's grass fed beef and there's grass fed grain finished beef. Most, you know, meat that you're about the grocery store is grain finished. And that's, you know, they use grain to fatten up the calf. It's cheaper meat. Uh, grass fed, grass finished meat is more expensive. But the whole thing, yeah, the whole thing is some people that are extremely sensitive to wheat products, grains, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be, they'll have reactions to, uh, to meat that is grain finished. So kind of the most strictest elimination sense is this level three where you're just eating beef and you're just drinking water. Uh, If you can afford to have a week or two of just grass finished grass, uh, yeah, grass finished meat, that's the best. But this basically gives you a baseline platform where you can reintroduce foods uh, like other meats. You can reintroduce dairy, you can reintroduce eggs and you can see how you do. Yep. That's, that's excellent. I really like that. And I think it's a, a really smart approach and a calculated approach to carnivore. Um, and would love Kevin, something you've written about recently and, and I've enjoyed, um, you know, it's a topic I know well, but it's always interesting to hear new takes and new ways of crafting the information, which is how are plants out there to harm us? And particularly where did nuts fall into that picture? Because I think this will be a a little bit of a new, new spin on it. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm I'm working I, I've done a lot of research in this area and I'm, I'm actually writing a big blog series on it right now. We just got it started. Uh, but I guess if we want to take a very simplistic view at it, uh, plants have been evolving for 500 million years, long before us humans have been roaming this, this earth. Uh, and throughout 500 million years through competitive evolution, uh, they adapt, they adapt ways to defend themselves against uh, predators. Uh, And so very simplistically, they don't have feet to run away. They don't have fangs to fight you. Uh, And so one of the most potent things they've had, and they have many mechanisms to defend themselves, uh, but the ones that us humans are most concerned about as far as consumption is the chemical adaptations that they have had to deter Things like incest or <laughs> insects from eating on them and uh, fungi and bacteria and pathogens basically from, from harming them. And so all I talk about plant parts. And so, you know, in plants, you got you got the seed, you got the roots, you got the stems, you got leaves, you got flowers, you got fruits. And all these parts have different purposes and they have different chemicals, uh, phytochemicals in them that are used to deter predation. And some of these uh, also consequently can harm human health. And so dosage is a big thing. What 
what you're eating, how you're eating it, how it's cooked. All these things play a big role uh, as far as uh, the impact they'll have on someone. Uh, and it, I, what I often talk about is like throughout evolution, human evolution, we've become more and more ill-equipped to eat these foods. Uh, some people are less ill-equipped than others. And I say it as a double negative like that uh, because we're all ill-equipped in some ways. Now we can detox certain talk, uh, things that are toxic to us. And so if you have them in low dose, then, you know, maybe you don't notice it or anything, or maybe it doesn't have a negative impact, uh, but it doesn't necessarily make it healthy either. So like I use alcohol as a common example, you know, it's a neurotoxin. We can, you know, we got enzymes that can detox it, but in general, it's not good to drink a whole lot of alcohol. Like that's pretty substantiated in, in, in the research. Yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of, I kind of took a few paths. No, that's great. I think that's a, that's a great way of summarizing it. I really like the evolutionary lens of the defense mechanisms and also, um, sort of the, the dose makes the poison, um, type of lens and, and the difference between sort of hormesis and, yeah, exactly. um, sort of toxifying yeah. your body. Yeah. I'm glad you bring that up because I hear a lot of people use hormesis as an excuse for basically everything. And hormesis is a valid concept. It's where you basically you stress something for someone that's maybe not familiar with it. Uh, and it adapts to become stronger, like your muscle. You stress your mu stress a muscle, it gets stronger. That's a form of hormesis. But people use this concept of hormesis to justify all kinds of things. It's like you, you can't just extrapolate hormesis and to justify you know, putting all kinds of toxins in your body. Uh, it, it just doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I I'd say, you know, a, a very, uh, just example, which you brought up is alcohol. There's yeah, exactly. really n nothing beneficial about it. Um, the studies, if you, if you look into them are actually very weak. Um, yeah. and, and one thing I wanted to mention, cause, cause you brought it up was the human evolution. Cause I'd spent so many years researching what I call looking through the microscope, you know, looking at things at, you know, a molecular level and very much understanding, trying to understand the, the pathways of how things were working. Uh, and it's not until more recently, the last year and a half, two years that I zoomed out. So I looked through a different lens and the, the, through the lens of evolution. Uh, and what likely is the best, you know, what, 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 if we look through an evolutionary perspective, what's the most likely things that humans are designed to eat? Uh, and that has been the most exciting, like eye opening research that I've done in the last two years. So as I, I've gone from looking through the microscope so intensely to really zooming out and looking at human evolution. And I wrote a big post on it, which, uh, kind of, kind of walks through, you know, three million years of human evolution. How did we adapt? Cause people are like, Oh, are we herbivores or are we carnivores? Uh, and I'm like, well, we uh, we evolved from herbivores, but like the key word is from, like, because <laughs> you know our an hominid ancestors are are absolutely herbivores. Uh, but that journey from herbivore to you know the our human species today and what we're designed to eat, uh, it, it's an interesting journey to to kind of look back at that through that lens. Right, right, yeah, absolutely. Um, I really like combining that and the science, I think it's, it's really powerful to take multiple, multiple yeah. views. It gives a more complete picture. Yep. Yep. And, um, to that sort of putting things in perspective, um, I I'd love to ask who needs to tinker with carnivore and who doesn't. And particularly you had a great Instagram story about this. How can a ruler help us make decisions about a carnivore diet? Yeah. So I talk about tinkering with the diet a lot because we <laughs> there I, there's two big problems with car people have two big problems with carnivore one is getting started so that's why i have that 30-day guide out and then the other problem people have is i is body composition uh and so what i mean by that is people want to get really super lean or they want to build a lot of muscle uh and so do you, people want to tinker with the diet too soon. And so what I mean by that is they want to start manipulating calories and macros and all kinds of things to achieve their goals. And most people do this far too soon. And so I wrote, I wrote a post, it's called fat, fat loss in the carnivore diet. And in it, I talk about John and Sally. And these are just two personas to, 
kind of give two broad categories that people tend to fall into. Uh, and so, and I could just explain them if it's helpful, uh, kind of John and Sally, because they get very different results when they start the carnivore diet, which causes all kinds of problems uh, and, and misconceptions and expectations. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, I, th- I think we should get into that a little bit. And, and also, um, I think you start the article, maybe you start with the personas, but at some point you say, you know, 95% of people yeah. should not need, tinker. Yeah, they, they don't need to or they, they won't even want to. Uh, by the time they... So if you don't tinker and you just follow the carnivore diet, kind of that's like that's laid out in that guide, uh, you'll never need to tinker. You'll get you'll get the results you want. Uh, but people are in, in a hurry and they don't want to give the, you know, the adaptation and healing the time that it needs. And so they start trying to tinker with it so fast and then and you know it really undermines results. But just to kind of talk to that, so John is the persona of this. I'll just. Give it like I gave in the article. He's, uh, he's a 50-year-old male. He's overweight, uh, pre-diabetic or diabetic, hasn't really done any diet, doesn't really exercise, and is and maybe it's his spouse or his doctor is like, hey, you got to get this under control. So he starts the carnivore diet, and John gets great results. He loses 100 pounds. He, his pre-diabetes reverses. His blood sugar normalizes. He feels great the entire time. And this is what we see on social media very often in these Facebook groups. You know, we read about John's all the time. Great success stories. Uh, but we don't hear about Sally's as much. And so Sally is the other persona. And I use Sally. I'm a Sally, so it's not a gender thing. Uh, but it's someone that has watched what they've eaten for a long time. Uh, they exercise. They've tried to do the right thing. They've probably been a yo-yo dieter. Uh, maybe they have autoimmune diseases or brain fog or something like that. Uh, maybe they're coming from a ketogenic diet, but they're already in pretty decent shape. Like they try and take care of themselves. Uh, and this person starts the carnivore diet. And what happens? They get super hungry. They eat a lot. They gain weight. They're getting fatter. And they're like, what is going on? And people don't think this can happen. They're like, they think something's broken with them. Uh, but for example, like when I started carnivore diet, I gained body fat. Uh, and so this happens. And what I say is like, it depends on where you start. Like if you start with from where John is, he's, you know, obese, he hasn't ever dieted. He hasn't worked out. And, you know, he goes to the carnivore diet. He gets, he only sees positive direction. Whereas a Sally, even though her body is getting healthy, uh, moving in a positive direction, she's getting a negative response in the mirror, uh, seeing some body fat increase. And this is totally normal. What will generally happen if they give it the diet time to do its thing, so to speak, uh, their, their fat gain will stop and oftentimes reverses. They will feel better. They will look better and they'll never need to tinker with the diet. Uh, but what happens is Sally starts wanting to tinker with the diet. She'll want to, you know, count calories. She'll want to manipulate macros and it really does have the tendency to undermine the diet. Usually Sally quits. Uh, goes back to keto, goes back to something else. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. That's exactly exactly what um, I really enjoyed about the post. I think you know my experience in <clears throat> zero carb or carnivore groups is exactly that. There's a lot of folks who have been in a deficit mindset, coming from a place of deprivation for so long that as soon as they start feeding themselves, and particularly feeding themselves with sort of an unlimited amount of food, um, their body is just absorbing these nutrients and going from this starvation state to a, yep. a feeding state. And it's like, we need to store everything like in case there's yep. another famine. Exactly. Um, and once your body, you know, fills up its reserves of those nutrients, gets to a more healthy place, um, in terms of hormones, in terms of, you know, eating habits, um, in terms of satiety and protein, yep. Um, that can level off and, and folks start to, to lose body fat again. Yeah. I mean, you just hit like on all of the biggest things, like, because there's a lot of things that are happening during that adaptation getting, I call it the getting healthy period, uh, which getting healthy is so, such a vague word because it means something different. It means different, something different for everyone. Uh, but you hit it, you know, like once you kill cravings, once your appetite regulates, once your hormones get healthy, like it's a, it's a night and day difference, but a lot of times people don't want to give it the time it takes to get to that. 
but some people do, and then tinkering does make sense if they're vain like myself and want to get, you know, really lean for summer or for vacation or whatever. And there's ways, you know, if you want me to talk about ways that people can tinker, I'm happy to. I'm always kind of reserved to talk about that because I'm like, like you said, 95% of people don't need to do it. But yeah. Yeah. But I do hear a lot from 5% that, that do want to tinker and they're like, hey, I want to get, you know, I want to get ripped. I'm like, all right, well, you can do it on carnivore. <laughs> yeah, it's that vocal 5%. Um, but yeah, I think I think meat is just such a great way to get rid of those cravings, heal heal that damage, get people back to a normal metabolic state. Um, yeah, it's, it's, in terms of the I, I don't think there's a better way. Yeah, in terms of the tinkering, why don't we start with, you know, before the shredding fat, aspect yep. can you build muscle on carnivore and is there anything that we as resistance training lifting carnivores should do differently than sort of the standard non-bodybuilding carnivore so i guess we could take this in various steps i mean go as deep as you want to go uh, but you can absolutely build muscle on carnivore okay so that's first that's absolutely certain uh i, I mean i've done it and I know that's N equals one, but, you know, money other people have done it as well. Uh, do you need to do anything different? So when it comes to muscle building, there's a lot of different – I mean, it depends on what someone's goal is. I, and I, I think the majority of people have, <laughs> have vanity goals like myself where like, hey, I just want to build some bigger muscles. Some people want to lift more weight, uh, you know, so strength training. Some people do like CrossFit, so they're more interested in, in you know, improving certain kind of metabolic uh, – uh, you know, metabolic training. So my, my point is there's a lot of different kinds of strength training, goal setting, and the way you approach your workouts is going to be different. So like a bodybuilder workout is going to be different than a strength trainer workout, you know, hypertrophy and strength training. Uh, while there's definite overlap, like they're, so they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, they are quite a bit different, uh, difference in volume and, and all kinds of things, technique even. So it depends on what someone's goal is. And whenever someone's talking to me, I'm always like, well, what, what do you want to accomplish? Like, if, you need to have a goal. If, you, if you're just saying, I want to build muscle, it's like, okay, do you want to build bigger muscles? Do you want to build stronger muscles? So you got to know where you're going. And then uh, once, you, once you understand that, you definitely can use nutrition as uh, a carnivore diet nutrition is a way to achieve those goals. And just like almost everything, I, I would prescribe uh, – progressive approach to nutrition and so if they are having a hard time gaining weight you know you add a eat a little bit more uh i'd probably start with protein up your protein and then if you're if, you, if you're stalling then you know eat a little bit more protein and fat uh but something that people need to understand from a muscle building perspective is muscle building is a marathon now newbies <laughs> there's jokes about newbie gains which are a real thing like if you've never trained before you have a tendency to build muscle at a, at a faster rate than someone that's been training for 20 years uh but in general building muscle is a slow process so people are like ah oh, i didn't see the scale move this this month well like that doesn't mean anything <laughs> uh and so like it, if you if, like if a trained athlete puts on five pounds of muscle in a year that's considered a very significant amount of muscle. Uh, and so, you know, using the scale as a, as a measuring tool to try and, you know, measure progress is not the best way to go about that. So is there a particular thing that you, that you want to discuss? Because uh, we can go deeper in detail as far as, you know, glycolytic training, easing into training, bodybuilding training, whatever you want. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. I, I, I think, you know, absolutely building muscle on carnivore. That's, that's a great point. Yes, you can do it. Protein is essential. Um, I also think, you know, before saying how you can build muscle, I think it's really mature of you to start with, hey, <laughs> this is coming from a national level physique competitor. You guys should see some pictures of Kevin. Um, he was ripped and it's slow. It's really slow. If you want to lose body fat, you can potentially do that faster, but um, yep. still, it's still better to do that gradually. But building muscle takes so long. It takes your body a very long time to create this tissue that is so dense and so metabolically expensive for our bodies to support. Um, so I think a lot of times it comes down to patience and proper training and, um, like you said, making sure you're eating enough. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because 
<laughs> fat loss is definitely, I don't call it a sprint, but it's, you know, you get much faster visible results with fat loss than muscle building, generally speaking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to ask you, Kevin, um, and this kind of has to do with, with the muscle building piece. Um, you know, you're an active guy. Um, I imagine you're still, you're still training, lifting a fair amount, probably not as much as you were. Um, but how do you think about protein and fat ratios and why, why are you not eating fatty ribeyes all day? Like Sean Baker is, um, if, if you, if you do work out a lot. Yeah. So I still work out every day. Uh, I train every day. I'm still, you know, I hate to, hate to say it's still got that vanity. I like to be a little bit leaner than, uh, my body might naturally set if I just ate all fatty meat. So let me start there. Uh, if I just ate all fatty ribeyes all day long, my body fat, it wouldn't, it, it's not going to be 20%, like, but it might be 12 to 15% body fat, uh, which is for most people like that. They're good with that. They don't need to go leaner than that. And it's great. Uh, for me, I like to be leaner than that most of the year. And so what I'll do is I, I I change my uh, protein to fat ratios. And it's basically as simple as that to get my body where I want it to be. So like I had a ribeye today, but uh, I, I'll cut off some of the edge of the fat and use that to grease the pan. And, and so basically it comes down to just eating a little bit leaner meat. I, I actually eat a larger quantity as far as like I ate four pounds of meat yesterday. Like that's a lot of meat, but it just tends to be a little bit leaner than most other carnivores do. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, um, I think, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get too deep into it now, but if folks want to learn more about tinkering with the carnivore diet, optimizing a little bit for fat loss or for building more muscle, you should definitely go to Kevin's blog, kevinstock.io, um, read, read that post, um, about fat loss, um, and, and also go to it, to his site, meat.health. Um, a lot of great content there on that, um, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, Kevin, you also had a really good, and this kind of gets to, to working out in athletics, but you had a interesting Instagram post recently about salt, which I enjoyed. Oh, um, yeah. I know there are folks in the carnivore community who, um, say you don't need it. There's some long-term carnivores who said, you know, it disrupts appetite. Um, I am the proud owner of a 20 pound bag of Himalayan salt. So right. I'll start with that, um, which I bought on Amazon. But what's your view on salt and electrolytes on carnivore? Yeah. So the, the Instagram post you're mentioning, I just finished off uh, this massive container myself that I had of pink Himalayan salt. And so salt was this area that I've researched a lot recently, uh, a lot this year. And I research when I research, I read, I, I do my best to take an unbiased approach. So I read, you know, I read the research papers in the low salt camp. I read the research papers in the high salt camp and why, why people say high salt's good. Why people say low salt. Yeah. People say high salt is good. There's a doctor that wrote a, just wrote a book, book called uh, the, the, the salt fix. And he gives all kinds of, you know, evidence and such that, you know, a lot of sodium is good for you. And, Long story short, I did that. I ate, uh, it was a, a million milligrams of sodium in three months, so 120 days, which turned out to be about eight grams of sodium a day. And I, you know, I was salting my meat a lot. Uh, and I was, and so basically the whole point of the Instagram post was, Hey, I ate this eight milligram, I ate eight grams of sodium a day for the last three months on average. I feel good, but I don't know. If that's good, uh, the, because the research and the whole point was like, I researched both both sides of the argument. And to me, the you know, if I had to put my, you know, what I thought the evidence really said, looking at all of it, it'd be the best is to end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, so don't super low sodium isn't good. Super high sodium might not be good, but somewhere in the middle is probably the best. But that middle, I don't know what it is. Is it one gram to 10 grams of sodium a day? Uh, it could be like it's inconsequential. And the whole point of that post was to say everyone likes to point to a research study and say, look, this says that. And at the end of the day, there are a lot of studies on 
any particular topic you might be looking into. And there's no such thing as a perfect study. So each study has flaws. And so uh, in that Instagram post, I'm like, well, it's very easy for me to say, I just ate eight sodium, eight grams of sodium a day for three months. I can go find the research that supports high sodium diets, say, look, this is, this is good for you. And then I could look at all the studies that say uh, high sodium is bad. And then I could just poke holes in those studies and say, well, they didn't account for this variable or that variable. Uh, and so, you know, I, get, I, I gave that Instagram post as, you know, for people that, it, that people ask me for research all the time. Like, tell me, show me the research behind the carnivore diet. Show me this research. And it's, it's not that easy. <laughs> so research has a lot to do with like, looking at both sides of the argument, looking at all the possible evidence you can, and then from all that evidence, which is going to be conflicting if you do your due diligence, you know, finding what, you know, making your own hypothesis basically off that. Uh, and so that's what I do. And people are like, you need to cite more research. I'm like, well, I, I read 300 papers to write this article. And instead of citing 300 papers and putting asterisks on each cited article and saying, this is the flaws of this article or this research paper. You know, I don't cite as much as, as other people. And I, and the whole reason is like, I don't see the point in confusing or trying to bias an argument. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of a long answer to the whole sodium. Should you have it or not? Like my honest answer is, I don't know. Uh, I, I know zero sodium is bad and I know, uh, I would presume like over 10 grams of sodium a day is probably too much. But if you're anywhere in the middle, I see, you know, there's research to support whatever you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. That, that was a great, great way of putting it. Um, I think it was, it might have been Sean Baker who said, um, or, or someone recently said, if you're waiting for a long term randomized controlled trial to prove one diet is more effective than another, um, it's never going to happen <laughs> in well, our yeah, lifetime. It's an those, a, a problem with a lot of the research is like, it's impossible to do certain the studies that we want to do. And then it's impossible to design a perfect study. And so like, I mean, I think research, like I do a lot of it. I think it definitely has its place and I probably do more research than most. Uh, but you can't just rely on on a research paper on PubMed, like it, it takes a lot more than that. And that's why I've actually found the evolutionary research I've done to be some of the most interesting because a lot of that is not, it's not like clinical trials. It's, it's, it's like a different view of research. And so I think, you know, trying to get a biggest, the biggest picture you can is the best way to, you know, come up with, and I'm always telling people, I'm like, you know, you gotta, you gotta do your own due diligence and, and think about, what makes the most sense for you. I'm doing it. And I'm trying to share what I, what I think is best, but you know, I could easily be wrong about a lot of things. I'm just, just from the evidence that I gather and the research I do and the lenses I look through, this is what makes the most sense. And that's kind of what I, I share with people. Mm, yeah. I like that. And and at some point you also have to self-experiment. Um, yeah, there, I do a lot there of that. Is, there's a, a lot little that. too much. Uh, there's a little too much of people having uh, analysis paralysis. And, yeah. and just just reading too much, waiting for the right study. You have to try things out. You know, you have yeah. you have a long life to live. Why not Why not spend a month or two trying different things? And I mean, I love I love self experimenting. I think a lot of people that do the carnivore diet are self experiment type, uh, or they probably wouldn't try the diet because, like you said, there's no there's no long term clinical randomized control study on a carnivore diet. Like that doesn't exist. So. <laughs> so you know these people tend to be self experimenters which which is cool which which is fun yeah yeah and and because I know you you have um by the way, I'll let you know when I get through my twenty pound bag of salt um, yeah i I hope you put a start date on that because I want to see the same instagram post <laughs> start date end date, okay, you know twenty pounds like I'm trying to think I don't know how big mine was, but it, you know it it was it was almost twenty three hundred servings that I did in three months. Which your twenty pound bag is a lot bigger than that. <laughs> it's hard to carry, um, <laughs> but um, I think you know because I know you have interests in finance and economics. Just sort of popped in my head one concept I wanted to bounce off you is there are a lot of folks, at least I know personally, and I'm I'm sure out there who are you know middle aged 
are starting to develop some health problems and they're really scared about the direction some of their markers, some of their levels are going. And they're, they've grown up in this community that's demonized saturated fat, cholesterol, oh, yeah. meat, um, eat your heart healthy, whole grains, etc. And the thing that's happened in tying this back to, to finance, at least in an obscure way, is there's this risk aversion that they feel that taking the risk would be trying something like a ketogenic diet or trying lowering their carbs, upping their fat. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And, you know, is, is, is there a way that, that maybe they could be thinking about it differently in terms of risk? So you, you are, are you saying that there's a lot of people that think they're afraid to do a ketogenic or carnivore diet because of the risk of health risk associated with those diets? Yeah, they think that by doing nothing um, and it's continuing safer. with a sort of a low fat standard American diet, they're taking less risk. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy because I mean, if you look at the, the curves of epidemics, like everything is getting so much worse doing what we're doing. Uh, and so it seems like doing anything different than what we're doing is probably a step in the right direction. Uh, but, but you're right. It's hard. So, you know, I experienced this with my, my own dad recently. He is not overweight. He works out, but he has elevated cholesterol and his doctor wants to put him on a statin. And man, I'm totally against statins. But I'm really, really against statins when it's for my dad. And I'm really, really against statins when it's for someone who's, like, healthy. <laughs> uh, it really doesn't have a history of heart disease in his family. And with a history of dementia in his family, I'm like, I mean, a statin would be the last thing I would, I would get on. But it's become conventional, you know, hey, this is, this is something we do. This is, and from his point of view, it's like, hey, this is standard protocol. Why risk not taking it? You know, so it's kind of, it's kind of the same thing. Like these people, they don't want to risk doing something new. Uh, and man, you're right. Cause it's hard. Cause like I talked to my dad, I'm like, look, here's, re here's the research. Let me talk to you logically. I know I'm, I'm not your internal, uh, medicine doc, but like, this is what I study. Uh, and so even, even that is hard to get through to someone. So, you know, I tell people the best you can do is lead by example. Like if you're doing a carnival diet and you're super healthy and you're feeling amazing and people are losing hundreds of pounds and like literally reclaiming their life, you know, it'll rub off by example. I think trying to convert people is often, uh, it's often just, it's, it's not, I don't want to say it's a worthless cause, but like people that don't want to change, it's hard to make them change. Uh, it's easier to let them see the change happening and then have them decide for themselves. And some people just, you know, will have a hard time making that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that about your father, but, um, yeah, I, no, I think, I think I'm getting through to him. So that's good. That's great. Um, but yeah, he's not taking the step. He, he has a strong example to follow. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure he trusts you as a researcher and, and, and a doctor. So that's, that's really great. Um, well, yeah. My, my older brother is, uh, he's an ophthalmologist, so he's an MD. I'm a DDS. If people are wondering, yeah. uh, but he's an MD and, you know, he's classically trained in dogma and he's an ophthalmologist. So he specializes in eye surgeries. And so he can tell my dad based on, you know, Hey, this is what I learned in med school. You should take a statin. Or, but, you know, so it's, they get, I guess the long story short is people are going to get point of views from all different kinds of areas. And sometimes the, the ones with the MD or the credentials are the very ones who are trained in the dogma. So it's hard for them to, it's even harder for them to, to look outside the box to say, maybe we should explore alternatives. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's tough for people when you get, when the people with the PhDs and the MDs might be the ones that are, you know, stuck in a way of viewing things that aren't working or outdated, et cetera. Right. Yeah. There's there's so much um, behind that, and and so much entrainment, and just years of um, sort of reinforcing some of the those findings um, yep. without a lot of experimentation. Um, yep. Well. Kevin, the thing I've been holding my breath for this whole time um, and would love to talk to you about, I'm very passionate about sleep. Um, people know oh, me, yeah. know I prioritize sleep above everything. You're I love smart, my sleep. You know, I go to bed at the same time every night. 
I'm, I'm a grandpa in that way. Um, but it's important to me. Um, and not many people talk about sleep and carnivore. And I think you're the perfect person to ask about it. You know, some people seem to get better. Some people seem to need less and wake up earlier. Um, so, so how, how do you think the carnivore diet affects sleep? So short answer is it negatively impacts sleep during adaptation. Uh, because all kinds of things, uh, a lot of times cortisol is elevated, you know, your hormones are just are like, what is going on? And so a lot of times people will get negatively sleep impacted, uh, early on. And then as people continue that, you know, that, that regulates and that becomes fine, but it is quite common, uh, from what I've seen so far that people tend to feel like they need less sleep, but the sleep they get seems to be better. Like they're energetic throughout the day. Uh, so I treated obstructive sleep apnea, uh, in a, in my private practice for years. And the Ned device is, was designed to treat sleep apnea right now. It's being used just to treat snoring because of FDA reasons. But nonetheless, I can tell you without a doubt, when someone fixes their sleep, it's life changing. And so like being a grandpa, like you said, going to bed early, same time, waking up, if diet is like Number one thing to affect your life, sleep is like number two. It is huge. Uh, but as far as carnivore diet and sleep, uh, I think there's still lots of, it's lots to learn. I think there's a lot to figure out. Uh, so I sleep about seven hours a night and I always try for eight, but I just, my body won't sleep for eight. And on a carnivore diet, I sleep seven. I feel good. I have energy all day long. Uh, so I'm not concerned about it. Uh, but, for the most part, you know, I, I think people I'm like, hey, try and get eight because most people can sleep eight unless you try and get eight. Uh, if you have apnea or might have apnea, treating that is one of the best things you can do in your life. Uh, I tell you, it's been like one of the most rewarding professions because literally you can change someone's life overnight when you treat sleep apnea. And so just a, I'll give two second background for people uh, that might be interested, but Someone with sleep apnea basically means they're not getting a deep level of sleep. Their airway is closing off when they go to sleep. Uh, the oxygen in their blood desaturates. Bad things. So basically, you're not getting a good night's sleep. And with medical treatment, you can treat sleep apnea. And you, people who get a real night's sleep for the first time sometime in 10 years, and literally it changes their life. So uh, if, if you think you might have sleep apnea, get that checked out. That's 100% worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And that's, that's really amazing. Um, it must've been really special treating people and just seeing their lives transform like that. Um, so how is, uh, yeah. How is your sleep? Yeah, th- that's a great question. So, um, first I wanted to ask, do you use anything to track your sleep, like the aura ring or another device? I don't, uh, okay. and it's not that I, th- I've heard a lot of great things about the aura ring. First of all, uh, but not, I'm not a, I'm not crazy off the edge, kind of crazy with the electromagnetic frequencies. Uh, but I do try and limit them. So like I put my mm. phone in airplane mode when I go to sleep, I don't want those, I don't want that uh, radiation right next to my head all night. Uh, I think we might find out in a, several decades that are like, all right, these cell phones, attached to our bodies 24 seven next to our brains aren't the best thing for them. Uh, to me, it kind of makes sense. You know, the arguments probably, I, I, that's not a common point of view currently, I don't think. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't know if it does. It's one of those things, the research, I don't know. I looked at the research. I don't know. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's one of those things. I'm like, it's easy enough for me to limit that. And if it is bad, I'm just going to do that. So I don't use those, uh, you know, any Bluetooth connected devices when I'm sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. I totally appreciate that. And, um, I, I do the same. I turn my phone on airplane mode whenever it's in my pocket. My, uh, my fiance is always getting angry at me saying, are you, are you missing text or something like that? Um, but I think it's, or, or you're overly paranoid or something like that. I'm like, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things. that's so easy to like, I'm not, <laughs> because I get the same thing. What if there's an emergency in the middle of the night? I'm like, ah, man, I haven't had an emergency in the middle of the night in my entire life. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I don't. So that's- yeah. But, um, my sleep, so I, I sleep a lot. So this, this is going to have a shock factor for people, but I typically go to bed at nine most nights yep. and I wake up, 
um, like naturally somewhere between five and six um, and try to, you know, stay in bed until six, six twenty. So I might be staying in bed too long actually. Um, but my sleep is very solid. I would say for how much I sleep, I get on the lower end of deep sleep, at least according to my aura ring, um, which does go into airplane mode um, while you sleep. At least oh, that's does. what the founder says. Um, oh, I, I got to do my research. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm lacking. So I get on a great night, I get one hour of deep sleep, but that is rare. Most nights I'm getting 20 to 30 minutes of deep sleep. Um, and that's like me being in bed for nine to 10 hours. Um, but I get a ton of REM sleep. It's usually three to four hours, sometimes four and a half. Um, so my body is kind of weird like that. Um, I, you know, use, uh, blackout shades. I have a cold room. I have an eye mask. I have earplugs. I have a chili pad. I have all these things, a weighted blanket. Um, yeah, I'm, I sleep like a king. But um, I feel great all day long. When I was on keto, my energy was not as good. I was still steady throughout the day, but definitely on carnivore, as you said, I have seen my energy improve. And I've even gone through times where my sleep has not been good, um, either because I was stressed out about something at work yeah, or that's a big factor. Uh, something happened. And I wasn't tired during the day at all. I was shocked. I was like... Maybe I am in bed too much. Maybe I am getting too much sleep um, because I I felt good with with less sleep. And I know that's a trap a lot of people fall into. Oh, I sleep four hours a night and I feel great. Um, when really your body's just like acclimating to it and it's becoming your new normal, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know, I wonder about that stuff. Do, could I could I get by um, sleeping less? Would I sleep deeper if I was in bed less? Um, so that's kind of my my situation. Well, yeah, and you said something actually quite profound there, and we see it with people with sleep apnea all the time, where they'll be like, during the day, like, oh, yeah, my energy's fine all day, and once they actually get treated and they have a good night's sleep for the first time, they're like, oh, my God, this is what energy is supposed to feel like. They get, they find a new normal. Their normal, their normal set point had down-regulated to thinking just a low level of energy was normal when, I'm, when really that wasn't, it's not normal at all. Uh, and so, like you mentioned, if someone's just getting four hours of sleep and they think they're feeling fine, well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I can't tell you for sure, but a lot of times people, uh, that are getting such low sleep, it's just, they have their sense of normal as down regulated. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, an another question I had and, and I'll share my personal experience first is I find that if I eat a large meal, of meat, um, anywhere even close to bedtime. Um, so within like three hours of going to bed, yep. um, my, at least my, I don't sleep as well. And my heart rate while I'm sleeping, um, is really elevated according elevated. to the aura ring. And yep. I'm way less likely to get into deep sleep. Um, do you find you need to adjust your eating times to optimize your sleep? And is that more so with carnivore? That's, that's very interesting. So a lot of people have a similar experience. Uh, and, and I mean, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you load a big meal into your stomach right when you go to sleep, the body's got to work to go to, to digest. Uh, whereas if you've already digested half that meal already or, you know, it's already digested, then your body does, isn't going to be working so hard to digest while you sleep. Uh, personally, I have just eaten. I have not experimented as much with meal timing as other people. Uh, just cause I, I work out in the generally like right around this time and which is where about 5 30 PM and I'll, I'll, I always eat after I work out. <laughs> so I, I do have a later meal. I do try and have, I, I gen, tend to have my biggest meal as my first meal of the day and a smaller meal in the evening. Uh, but a lot of people have, have, have mentioned that same thing where if they eat too much late. Uh, it'll definitely impact their sleep. I'm curious, uh, maybe you've done the research, because uh, I have not. I've done the research with, uh, was it, uh, whatever the wrist, what, what's, what's the wrist sleep tracker? Uh, um, there are a few. Um, there's the Fitbit. Uh, Fitbit, that's what I'm trying to think of. Sleep. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I'd done a lot of research on the Fitbit and I used to use that to track my sleep. And I did the research and it all pointed to just it was very inaccurate. Now, that was a couple of years ago. Technology's probably improved. The aura ring maybe maybe much better. Uh, but I, you know, I was comparing those to polysomnographs or PSGs, like actual sleep tests, and they're quite different. And so I just was never impressed with the accuracy of it. Uh, but perhaps they've gotten much better. I, I don't know if you know. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I'll say I haven't done an independent assessment to the extent I should. I have, um, you know, basically entrusted the opinions of people yeah. I would consider sleep experts. Um, like there's a guy named Alex Fergus, um, who is actually pretty similar to you, Kevin. He's, he's a serial entrepreneur, really smart guy, um, out of New Zealand, um, who writes a lot about sleep and he yeah. writes a lot about the aura ring. Um, and he, he is a huge advocate of it. Um, there are other sleep doctors I've heard recommending it. And they claim, at least by their own science and research, which I haven't looked into deeply, Aura claims that they're within like 99.6% of the more expensive like sleep study equipment. That's what, yeah. So I was wondering like, how, how close they compare yeah. with like a, like a, a PSG or yeah. a home sleep test. A home so sleep so they, they claim to be you know, within 1%, both in terms of um, sleep cycle detection, as well as, you know, HRV, heart rate variability. Does it measure oxygen saturation? Uh, so it measures, it measures respiratory rate, um, yeah. which I'm sure you'd find interesting. It yeah, it's interesting to see that. Core body temperature um, based on your finger, which is supposedly accurate. Um, and it measures heart rate, heart rate variability, and it also measures heart rate like fairly often throughout the night. So you can get a really good measure of it. Um, I, I, I like it. I think it's, it's fairly accurate. Is it necessary for people? Probably not if you're practicing good sleep hygiene, but I find the data really interesting. Does it have a microphone that records snoring at all? No. Oh, I'm surprised they don't implement that. <laughs> Yeah, because um, I've had a lot of patients. I, there's snore apps. Uh, I've used those a lot in developing this nasal device to treat snoring. Uh, oh, interesting. But yeah, I'm, I, I I've told people for a while now that eventually the technology will be there where something like an aura ring will. It's basically will be like sleeping with a home sleep study, which it'll be able to tell you, oh, you have apnea. Oh, you're just snoring. You know, th those sleep parameters. I, I think it's just a matter of time before. Uh, we all have that information basically on our fingers, so to speak, uh, because I mean, apnea and sleep problems. These are these are some of the most common problems in in, in the United States, as far as like untreated sleep disorder, untreated uh, uh, disorders like sleep apnea is up there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I've had friends um, who have suffered from it. And it just seems like it completely changes their lives when they get <laughs> treated, and it's just so prevalent. Uh, so. It's a it's a field where you know a lot of good can be done. Hopefully, that hopefully they keep that technology progressing, uh, so we can you know easily get diagnoses off those kind of devices. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've I've enjoyed this conversation very much, Kevin. Thank you so yeah, much it's been a for blast. coming on. Um, is there anything else you'd like to cover or share with folks? No, I mean if I can help, I know always happy to help. Uh, the, I <laughs> started to get about. 10,000 emails a day. So I, I'm trying to have most questions in the Facebook group uh, or on the website, but, you know, shoot me a message if people need, if people are interested in help, That's Instagram, great. whatever. And where can people find you? I'll also link it in the show notes um, on carnivorecast.com, but let them know where they can find you. Well, if they're looking for useful information, like the website or yeah, the website's the best place to go. But if you want to connect with me, just Instagram or Facebook is totally cool. And that's meat.health and kevinstock.io. Yep. Right on meat.health and kevinstock.io. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Have, have a great rest of your day. Hey man, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for the time. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. 
You can also email me at info at I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.